I'll probably just kind of pick and choose the ones I want to start going over. But if you have specific problems that you want me to cover or look at today, I can do that. Um, kind of the, they're all kind of up here on, on Canvas. So I think if I'm saying which one to focus on the most, probably practice exam B has a lot more linear regression stuff. So it's just a lot more uh, examples. One thing I'll mention, I thought we would have enough time and we didn't. So on practice exam A, I told you you don't have to worry about kind of this squared stuff. So you can kind of like ignore question one here. Um, we didn't necessarily kind of look into it, or I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but I said I'm not going to expect you to answer questions about including these quadratic terms. Okay. So you can kind of ignore problem one on this practice exam A. Okay. Anybody have a specific one they want me to start out with or just start kind of pick and choose? All right. So I'll go to practice exam B. I'll do a little bit of old stuff and kind of just flow into some new and kind of more regression stuff. So if we go back, um, <clears throat> oh, and actually, one thing I did not pull up yet is this formula sheet. Okay. So Kind of what I'm going to expect of you, kind of on this exam, um, is just moving it from match pairs examples. Um, then we had ANOVA testing, and we had a linear graph. Right? So these first kind of set of equations on the formula sheet is kind of this match pair stuff that we had talked about. So if I go here, and I've got you know before and after calorie consumption of oh, what is this kind of you know somewhere McDonald's, right? According to an individual, we kind of create this difference variable. We then find the mean difference is negative 50, and the variance on that difference is 22,500. We're given this null term hypothesis, which right, it's a little bit small there, but it looks like I'm looking for is it less than zero? I assume the opposite is true, which is that it's greater than or equal to zero. So what type of tail test would I have here? So when I look at my alternative hypothesis, I've got a less than sign, so I've got this left tail test. So whatever test statistic I find, and I'm not sure, I, I might add some questions in here that I could ask as we work through this. The area to the left would represent my p-value. Okay. And if I was wanting to find, you know, I don't know where it would fall at relative to the right. If my critical value that gives me alpha in the tail, right, I'm looking for alpha in that left tail as well. Okay. Now, anytime we have matched pairs, we only had you know, this sample difference. Uh, sorry, the, sa the sample variance of the difference. So we know that we're going to have to use the student T distribution. Now, the formula sheet, which is open right here, it kind of reminds us of that, kind of notating that test statistic comes from a student T distribution, similar kind of for the confidence interval, reminding us that it's coming from the student T distribution. So from there, it's just a matter of we have that formula, right? So we can even write it down from the formula sheet. So we had look like this, right? Just a matter of plugging our values in. Hopefully these are easy questions, these test statistic ones for like match pairs example um relative to some of the other stuff that we're doing because it's just plugging our values right so we found negative 50 over the square root of 22 500 over 42 right yeah might be a stupid question but uh it's match pairs because we have that that being at the bar right? yes yeah, so we're looking at the difference right we took two variables before and after calorie consumption we created this difference variable right and then found the average of that so if i looked at these right away i mean if i remember that my denominator always represents like a standard deviation well here for my match pairs examples, whatever the sign of that average difference I find is, it's going to tell me the sign of my test statistic. So I found the average change, so the average difference was negative 50, so my test statistic has to be negative. All right, so right away, I know it's going to be either A or C. If I plug everything in, I think, someone can check me on this, but I think that you get negative 2.16. I could be wrong. I don't remember all these off the top of my head, and I, I definitely can't do that math in my head. 
questions on that one? It's not too bad. I think the next one asks for the critical value, but let's instead assume that I ask you to find kind of the P value here instead. So what you should do is look up on that student T distribution, this test statistic of negative 2.16, you wanna find the area to the left. It's coming from that student T, so you need to know your degrees of freedom, which is simply N minus one right, or 41, okay? Now this is where if I ask you a question like this on the exam, I'll ask you to calculate the test statistic, but that would then likely give you an assumed true test statistic. So I might have you do this work and then say, I don't know, assume that the test statistic you found was negative 3.5, right, instead, right? Just to kind of make sure everyone's starting off on the same foot and you don't have kind of cascading errors there, right? If I phrase this as a multiple choice. So we will pull up that student T distribution somewhere. There it is. We're going to go down to the degrees of freedom of 41. So scroll down. Now, the problem is, if I'm looking here, well, first of all, I don't have any negative values because the student fee table always looks at the right side. But it doesn't matter, right? If I looked up 2.16 and found the area to the right, that's the same as finding the area to the left of negative 2.16, right? Because it's a symmetric distribution. Now, I couldn't remember these values, so I would actually have had to give you like an assumed true test statistic of something like this, okay? I won't make you kind of put the p-value in a range. I would give you an assumed true test statistic that is one of these values, right? So let's say instead I told you assume that the test statistic is negative 2.421 that you found. Well, I can find that value here and the area to the left of that, well, sorry, the area to the right of the positive value or the area to the left of the negative of that value would be 0 0.01. So I've got my p-value of 0 0.01, all right? So that's how you could look up p-values if I'm giving you these assumed true test statistics for these match pairs examples, okay? Any questions on that? What if it was a two-tailed test? What would change here? Let's say I found the same test statistic. What's the only thing I'd have to do differently? If I know the area in the left tail for a two-tailed test, <laughs> They don't switch the sign, right? I'm, I mean, I, <clears throat> I found the p-value is 0 0.01. So if I'm still looking up the p-value, I have to remember, well, yeah, the probability I saw something that was inconsistent with the null or any further is represented by this area, but there was also values on the other side that now go against the null. So when we had a two-tailed test, we said whatever area we find in one tail, we have to multiply it by two. Okay. So when we're using our test statistic, to find the p-value, right? Then for a two-tailed test, we'll need to multiply whatever area we find by two. Now, if we're using our, I can do this, right? Alpha to find our critical value, right? Which I think is the next question. Well, if I do have a left-tailed test, like we had before, what critical value would give me, and I don't remember the alpha that it asks, so we'll go back and look. Uh, 0 0.05, right? So the alpha is 0 0.05 there. So we'll go back here. So if I wanted 0 0.05 in my tail, I would raise the freedom of 41. 1.683 is the value that would give that to me, but it's a left tail test. So I know that the critical values will be negative, right? Now, if it was a two-tailed test, what's the only thing that's gonna change? Well, I'm no longer gonna have alpha in the tail. I'm gonna have a pair of critical values that give me alpha over two in each tail. So if I ever have a two-tailed test and I'm using alpha to find my critical value, I need to make sure I'm not looking up alpha, but alpha over two, and I'm gonna have a pair of critical values there, okay? Those are kind of our differences between our one and our two-tailed test. When you're using the test statistic to find the p-value, once you have the area in one tail, you need to multiply it by two. And then if you're looking up critical values from alpha, you need to remember that you're not actually looking up alpha in the table, you're looking up alpha divided by two. Okay. 
Any questions on that before we keep moving? It's a little bit of a, a refresher on the hypothesis testing. Um, we'll then kind of go down here. Let's look at this in Nova. So I had this exam kind of set up like some short answer, but I'll, you know, these could be turned to multiple choice or some of the multiple choice could be turned to short answer. Um, but this one, uh, you know, what can be said about the variation in BMI at the 95% level in respect to gender and smoking status? So here we've got kind of different BMI measures, kind of the gender groups. And then we also kind of have different levels of, of smoking behaviors. Yeah, I don't think I had a multiple choice. So when I've got this ANOVA table, this is our kind of first step at trying to hold other factors constant. Right? So when we get this out for the cell, I would give it to you with something like this. We can see that we've got the p-value associated with both rows and columns, right? Or the row and column variation. Now here, the p-values are pretty large, right? So I'll kind of go through instead what would it would mean if we had maybe some different values. So I think I'm going to change this just to make it a little more interesting. This is what the actual data is but I might do something more like this, right, on the exam. So maybe I say at the 99% level, or sorry, at the 90% confidence level or the 10% significance level, can I say that there's variation in BMI with respect to either one of these factors, right? So if I'm looking at this, I start out assuming that there's no variation. So go back even the way that we had this was like holding constant oh actually i could start with one one huh holding constant the other factor so like holding constant gender do i see variation in the mean bmi across smoking stats right so we always start out assuming that these are all the same right that every single mean is exactly the same so if we can reject the null what we're really saying is we found evidence that there is variation, right? That these means across the group, different groups, why don't I keep starting out with one, one, two, one, two, and one, three. We found evidence instead that supports the alternative, right? That there is variation, that these means aren't the same. So all we're going to do is use that same rule of is the p-value less than alpha. If it is, we can reject the null. So if I'm looking here, an alpha of 0.1, what can I say? That there's variation in BMI in respect to, well, not the rows, right? But looks like there's variation in respect to the columns. Okay. So what I could say is that holding constant their smoking status, there's no variation in BMI in respect to gender, right? The rows that are changing. Okay. I can say there's no uh, variation because I can't reject them all. But for the column variation, right, moving across the columns while holding constant the rows, so holding constant gender, it looks like there is variation because I can reject the null. So there is variation across smoking status with BMI. Okay. Any questions on why I can say that or want me to say that again? I can try to phrase it in a different way. So, so really what you're looking for, I guess, if you want to really make it simple is if your p-value is less than alpha, then you're saying that there is variation in respect to that thing that's changing. So if my p-value is less than alpha, I can say that there is variation in BMI across the columns, or in this case, across smoking status. But if my p-value is not less than alpha for the rows, well, then I can't say that there's variation across the rows or kind of between gender here, we only had two groups, kind of made this one a little bit easier. Right. So another kind of good review of this one, if you go back, um, I forget what homework it was on now, but there was kind of a question I had in Nova table. I've got the answer key up there, so you can kind of go and, and work through that one as well, or go back through the notes and kind of the, the different Nova stuff that we looked at there. Um, but really that's the only kind of question I'm gonna ask you there is whether or not we see variation in respect to either one of these factors, right? And all we're doing is using that p-value compared to alpha. If it's less than alpha, we're rejecting that there's no variation or instead saying that there is variation. Any questions on that? And it's not like I'm gonna make you do this in Excel, I'll give you the Excel output, right? So it's just a matter of interpreting those, those p-values, okay? All right, so this one, um, 
hopefully isn't too bad. So these will be kind of some, maybe starting out some of the easier adjustment questions. We'll then kind of start to transition to some harder ones. So I know this is a little bit small, um, but here I'm going to give you this regression output and I've got wage is my Y variable. So sometimes you can kind of help and I don't always write them on the exam. I just tell you what the dependent variable is. So here I told you it was wage. And then you can kind of think about you have what? Years of education, experience, age, and what's the last one? Kind of this gender variable, which to make it easier, it's what? One if the individual is male, zero if female. So kind of write that as male instead, just to kind of know what the one group is, right? So I run this regression, I get this output, right? Uh, the first thing I asked is, well, what's the interpretation of that coefficient on education? Right? So if I looked at, okay, what's that coefficient, that slope coefficient on education? It's like it's 1.23, right? So what that's saying is that for every one unit change in education, which how is education measured? Here we have it measured in the years of schooling, right? So one additional year of education, right? So one year of education, would cause my predicted Y value to change by about a dollar and 23 cents, right? So holding everything else in this regression constant, right? So holding the age of the individual constant, the experience level, and whether or not either they're both male or they're both female, right? Having one more year, but one of them has one more year of education, we would predict their hourly wage is about $1.23 higher, right? So if we're looking here, holding everything else constant, Every additional year of education is correlated with a dollar twenty-three, well, one point two three three, I guess, uh, dollar increase in in our hourly rate, okay. hourly wage side. Questions on on that kind of doing that interpretation? Is it, so just kind of give you a couple other ones. How would I interpret? And they're all kind of easy here because they're measuring the same units. But how would I interpret the age variable? What's a one unit change in age? We've got up here, how is it measured? Oops. It's measured in years. So how would I interpret that age coefficient? Oh, what the value is? Oh, my mouse is over, isn't it? Right, so that coefficient, the value is negative 0 0.019. So how would I interpret that coefficient? This is going to be one of the easier questions. So if we can't do this, we're in trouble. I'm just going to try. Okay. Um, for every year, it goes goes down point zero. Mm -hmm. So for every additional year, someone ages, right? Every year older they get. And to say it goes down, kind of the way we would interpret it is making sure we're listing or naming what that variable is. So our dependent, I the so I'm sorry, our dependent variable here, right, was hourly wage. <laughs> so for every year older somebody gets, we would predict their hourly wage actually goes down by about two cents, right? Now, that might seem kind of trivial, right? It's just the effect of one additional year of age. And, you know, the whole reason why sometimes, you know, this is pretty close to zero. You notice, can I actually say that there's a relationship between age and hourly wage in this data? My p-value is 0.82. No, right? It's not going to be less than alpha. We always start out assuming that these slopes are zero, right? So if I can find a p-value that's less than alpha, I can reject that and say, no, you know, I'm assume there is no relationship. If I can reject that, I'm saying there is a relationship. I'm nowhere close to being able to, to reject it with, with age, right? So it looks like there's really no strong evidence here, no evidence at all that age and the hourly wage here are correlated. However, if I look at um, the first one we did, right, education, well, that's highly significant, right? A p-value of 0 0.002, we definitely can reject the null there. Right, rejecting that there's no relationship, saying we found evidence that there is a relationship between additional years of schooling and hourly wages. 
How would I interpret that gender variable? Remember, kind of one individual's male, zero if not. Yeah. Is that saying that since one is so one would be like one increase from zero? So the saying that if you're male, then you earn on average, well, their you know, p value is about 18. So, like, it's not that confident, but we can say that yeah. the males do make. So, so, you're kind of answering this very comprehensively. So, we actually will break this down into two parts. First thing we do, no, which is good. Like, you're actually like, it is a comprehensive view. That's actually what we want to have. So if the person's, where is that? So if the person is male, relative to female, we would expect their predicted wage is about $2.29 higher. That's the first thing we do. That's how we interpret that coefficient. Now, the next question is, okay, there is some sample evidence that males are on average, right? For looking at males relative to females, their predicted wages are higher, right? However, the p-value is 0.18. So I can't really say, at any reasonable level, like our benchmark levels of 99, 95, 90% confidence, I can't reject that there's no relationship between gender and wage here. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that because alpha is? It doesn't matter what my alpha would be, right? I could do, uh, but yeah, 0. 0.1, my p-value is 0. 0.18. So that's not less than alpha, so I can't reject this. Yep. So like you said, like, and it's not like the weakest evidence, right? If I look at this, you know, well, okay, where was that? P value, no, there it is, 0.18, right? Well, if I want to do with 80% confidence, right, the 20% significance level say there's a relationship here between gender and hourly wage, I could, right? So it's not like the strongest, but it's also not the weakest kind of evidence either. Um, you know, it kind of depends on what we're trying to predict, how accurate would it be? Is 80% confidence enough? That kind of dives down into to more complex issues outside of this class. But for us, we just want to know, how do we interpret that estimate that we found? And then based off of the kind of variation of data, given our p-value, can I actually say there's a significant relationship there? Right. Okay, Any questions on, on, on that before we keep going? So let's see what other questions do I have here. I can think of a few. So one that I'll ask here, and we skip the test statistic one, but we'll come back to that. I know these are hard to see. So let me see if I can, oops, zoom in a little bit here. All right. So if I'm looking at these variables, which of them can I say have a significant relationship, right, with hourly wages? So kind of saying that there's a relationship between the two variables, wage and whatever one I'm looking at. I have to be rejecting the null, right? Because I start out assuming that there's no relationship between any of these variables and wages. So which of these can I say have a significant relationship with uh, wages? And let's say at the, I forget what the question said, but let's just say at the 95% confidence or the 5% significance level. So which one of these could I say have a significant relationship with our wages? Give you a hint. And when I say this, I'm not worried about the intercept. There's two of them. Education experience. Yeah, right. The only two variables that have p values less than 0 0.05 are education experience. These two p values are quite a bit large. So if the p value is really large, we can't reject the null, or we can't say that there's a relationship. Now, the intercept is significant here as well, but I was just kind of talking about the four kind of independent variables, right? Speaking of the intercept, how would I interpret that intercept? So the interpretation of our intercept kind of gets a little bit easy. We can be very specific, or there's just one general rule that we always can remember, which is the intercept is our predicted Y value if every variable is equal to zero, right? So that's a general way of saying that, and that's okay. I could be more specific and say, someone with zero years of education, zero years of experience, age zero, which the interpretation of that can get kind of weird sometimes. It's usually something we can't observe, but it's almost like this point, like way back out of our visual, like we can't see it, but it's where the wage would start out if we ever could get back to that point, right? And that was the idea that 
maybe there's something where we only ever see data out here, we're never gonna actually see this X value be zero. But that's still where our line would intersect the axis, right? So someone who has zero years of education, age zero, zero years of experience, and they are female, we would predict the hourly wage is about $8.6. So that's kind of like a, the starting out hourly wage. And then as these factors change, the wage starts to deviate from that point. It's easy to think about when we just have one variable because we can get kind of this nice two-dimensional visual. When I've got four here, I can't even really visualize it. It's not even three-dimensional, right? So it's it's kind of hard to put kind of get a nice visual, but it's like your intercept is your starting point. And then as these factors change, you're kind of like weaving in and out of like all these different dimensions, if you know anything about that. Any questions on that? We're okay with it so far. Um, oh, I skipped over. How do we find the test statistic? This is a gimme question. I'm trying to give you points when I ask you this. So if I go to my formula sheet and here, I, I'll clean this formula sheet up because you're not going to actually use this. This is a Nova stuff that we don't didn't use. Excel is just doing all this behind the scenes. But here we've got our test statistic equation for, for uh, slope coefficients, which is simply take that slope estimate and divide it by its standard error. So when I'm looking here, how I blanked out the test statistics, which usually subgives that to you, but I just wanted to make a point of it. It's like all these other sample statistics that we were looking at, we'll take the sample statistic. So here we can think about another way I can write this is, and I'll just use B to represent the slope. We would take that sample statistic, the slope coefficient we found, We'll subtract the assumed true value, but we said we're always going to use zero, right? We're always assuming that there is no relationship, so we can kind of ignore that. And then what we'd want to do is divide by the standard deviation of our statistic, which we said is kind of represented by this thing called the standard error. That's really what the standard error is. It's capturing the standard deviation of that slope coefficient. Yeah. Can we that Yeah, so that was right here. Okay. It's just the slope divided by my standard error, right? So if I wanted to reproduce this column, if you actually open the file, I just put a block over here so we can actually move this. Um, but I, I would just take my coefficient divided by my standard error, and that's how I'm getting these types of statistics. So you could, you know, hopefully that's a really easy question on the exam. Right? Well, I ask you. Well, no, but I mean, hopefully you can divide one number by another. I mean, you're in college, right? Like this is, I mean, this is, I don't know. This should be an easy question, right? So, you know, if I go through here, you know, it's it, it just take the coefficient for that variable and divide by standard X. <laughs> Any other questions on kind of that output or any kind of expectations of questions there? Okay. All right, so we went through these. So let's think about making some predictions here. So let's start out with a more simple regression here, very naive, where we've got GPA and SATs. Right? So I'm trying to estimate, we've done this one in class, I want to estimate this relationship. Um, and I end up kind of finding that the intercept coefficient is 1.5, the slope coefficient is 0.002. I got a standard error for that for both of those. And then I say, okay, what's the test statistic for my X and P slope coefficient? Once again, just my coefficient divided by my standard error. So I'm looking at my slope coefficient. That's the one that's associated with my X variable, right? My intercept coefficient is the one that's just sitting there by itself, right? It's not being multiplied by anything, it's always added into my variable. So I'm looking at beta one. So that's 0 0.002 divided by well, what was the standard error of that coefficient, 0. 0. 0. 0.00075. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm guessing this is 2.67, but I could be looking at this wrong. All right, let me check my math and I think, I think that's right. Um, so it's as simple as that, right? If I'm asking you to find these test statistics, these should be some, some easy ones, right? If 
I then ask, okay, interpret that intercept co coefficient of 1.5. So if I'm writing out, how could I make my predictions? All I do is plug in those coefficients that I found. So plug in my intercept, plug in my kind of slope coefficient. So how would I interpret my intercept here? It's even easier than the one we just did. So the intercept, yeah. I'm gonna take a stab at it. So what would C actually be the interpretation of? It would be the other way around. So you're thinking about a slope coefficient when you're doing that type of interpretation, right? With the intercept, it's not unit changes. With the intercept, we said this is the predicted value of our y variable. Oh, so it's a. When all of our variables equal to zero, right? So it's not going to be the average, right? It's going to be where does it start out? So when you have someone getting a zero on their SAT score, the predicted GPA starts out at whatever that intercept coefficient is, in this case, 1.5. And that kind of makes sense. So I plug the zero into this prediction equation. Well, now I'm just thinking about, well, what's the intercept represent? It represents when the SAT is zero. Well, that's just the predicted value of our Y variable, where our GPA kind of starts out. We want to think about it that way instead. All right, so on the other one, we said it was when all the X variables were equal to zero, right? In this case, it's just, we only have one variable. So it's when the X variable equals zero, okay? Is that questions on that interpretation there? So I think the next question has, if you had someone with a 1200 on their SAT, what would you predict their college GPA to be? Making these predictions from a naive regression like this would hopefully be very easy. I might on the exam ask you to do a similar thing, but with more variables, right? So I'll show you an example of that in just a second. But here for a simple one, all I'm doing is plugging in that value of that X variable or SAT score using my slope and intercept coefficient to come up with what that predicted Y value is, All right? So 1200 times 0 0.002 plus 1.5, it's gonna be what? 3.9, okay. So just plugging in that value for X and getting that, that prediction, okay? Questions on that? Hold on, is that 3.9? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so we got that one. What do I say? Oh, I know what else I wanted to do. Uh, let's see, let's skip down here. So I'll go back up to the one that we already looked at since we kind of have some context for it. So, Something else I might ask you to do is instead of make these kind of easy predictions, well, what if I've got several variables, right? So let's say, um, what is the expected or what is the predicted wage of, I don't know, female, five years of experience, 32 years old, what was my other variable? Oh, and we'll say, what? 16 years of education, All right? So here I'm trying to make a prediction, but I've got this hypothetical person and I've got more than one variable here included in my regression, okay? So if I wrote out this regression, what it would look like is, okay, I was looking at my dependent variable that I'm trying to predict, which is wage. I'll then have my intercept, which I've got the value here. So 8.68, just plugging in my intercept. Then I've got my first variable slope, which is 1.23 times their actual education level, plus 0.417 times their years of experience, plus, no, nope, it's negative, so minus 0 0.0019 times their age, and then plus 2.29 times this gender variable, which we said if we write it as kind of what the one group is, that might make it a little bit easier to interpret. Okay. 
So I just wrote out my regression equation, just plugging in these estimates that I had for the intercept and for the slope on each one of these variables. Now to make my predictions about what Y is, or what the wage is here, it's a matter of plugging in this hypothetical person's value. So they're female, so this is zero. 32, what was it? Five years of experience, 16 years of education, right? I mean, and once again, like, hopefully this is something easy to kind of get entered into our calculator. We're just kind of multiplying each slope coefficient by the X value, adding them all up. One thing that's easy to forget to do in this process when you're kind of breaking this down, don't forget to add in that intercept, okay? Is that making sense how you would do that when you have multiple variables on the right-hand side? Any questions? I've got one more thing I want to say. I don't want to forget. Okay. So don't get confused. Um, sometimes I have, I think people, with the discussions that we've had, when you're making these predictions, even if you have variables that you didn't pick up significance for, we'll still factor those in, right? So notice here, like I can't reject the null for age and gender, but I'm still using them to make my predictions because when I ran this linear regression in the background, I was using all of those variables to come up with predictions that would minimize my errors. So I still need to use those variables when I'm making my predictions in order to kind of really be using this line of best fit. Okay? So just because we can't reject the null doesn't mean they don't get used in our prediction, right? Now in practice, like outside of this class, I just had somebody, um, I, I, used to have, I had an honors three years ago and um, they're in the M for the accounting program right now at the graduate level. So they're doing a stats class at, in that. And the next step would be like, once you find variables don't matter, well, in practice, you rerun the regression without those variables, and then you make predictions based off of the, that output. But for us, we're just going to have the output that we have, right, and use every variable that we've included to make our predictions, okay? So it's a little bit hokey because in practice, you would, you would kind of continue to run regressions, you know, until you only have variables where you're picking up the significance, um, depending on what you want to do. But. All right. Anything else I want to mention here? I think we're all oh, um, and I, I, I might ask you kind of a direct question, um, but it's more likely I present you with multiple types of regressions. Um, <laughs> the other stat that we talked about was what that we have up here. You remember one that we compared across models? Well, it was the R squared, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is the R squared, right? That's the other thing we're talking about. So what does the R squared tell us, right? The technical definition is the proportion of the variation in our Y variable that all of our included X variables explain, or the variation, our dependent variable of wage that our independent variables of education, experience, age, and gender explain. Another way to think about this is, I think I told you, I have another section, so hopefully I did both of you. It's kind of like a ratio of your predictions to the actual Y values, right? Like how accurate are my predictions, okay? So a higher R squared means it's better, right? If I could get an R squared of one, that would mean my predictions are exactly 100% right, right? So R squared of one represent 100%, right? I'm explaining 100% of the variation, mm -hmm. right? So here we've got what? We're explaining about 36.8% of the variation, right? It's always kind of displayed as a proportion, but we can easily convert that into a percentage by just moving the decimal two places. And then the real use of that R squared is if we're looking at different regressions, we said, let's say I, I gave you this output, and then I said, okay, I somehow obtained some more data. I then include what their major was, um, and I don't know, uh, what region of the country that they're, they're living in, right? Because we might have significant variation in terms of like, you know, the Northeast versus the South. So I run this new regression, I give you that output and the R squared you would expect would be one. So if I've got all these same variables, but I also include region of the country. What was the other one I said? Oh, major choice, like what field they're working in. 
Okay. What would I expect my mu r squared to be relative to this one? All right, all right. If I'm using more variables, my regression, you can just think about it as I'm now going to have more variables that are factoring into my prediction. So my prediction should be more accurate. Okay. So being more accurate means an r squared closer to one or higher. So by adding in these additional variables, I can increase my R squared, right? And if I'm trying to choose what models kind of fit it best, like let's say I, let's say I didn't include the same, I'm like, okay, I ran this regression to predict wages, and then I ran another one where I only use region and uh, major choice, and I get an R squared of 0 0.2. Well, that one would actually be making worse predictions, so this would actually be a more preferred model in terms of making predictions for wages. Now, in practice, why would we run those two separately? We have all the data, just we run it all at the same time to kind of get the highest R squared possible. Um, but that's, I, you know, we want to think about using that R squared to make decisions like that. I think on the individual assignment, you know, the, the way it plays out is you're comparing level, level, log, level, level, log, log, log models, which one best fits the relationship between those two variables, or which one has the highest R squared. Right? Um, so the two things we've really talked about that can influence the R squared, you can change it to be one of these nonlinear models using natural logs, or you can add an additional kind of right-hand side or control or, or independent variables. Any other questions? Any questions in general for the exam? We'll kind of pick up probably on question 11 on Monday. We'll work through some more of these short answer ones. Um, like I said, you can ignore anything where we have kind of the squared term in it. Um, we didn't quite get that far, so I won't kind of ask you questions and I introduced it, but I'm not going to expect you to, to answer any questions about that. Any questions for me? All right, I forget exactly when this exam is. Do any of you remember off the top of your head? Thursday, okay, as I say, I have too many sections. I know I've got, yeah, I was going to say, 9.45 to 11.45, correct? Yeah, I was going to say, I've got, I know I've got two Wednesday and one Thursday. So you're my only exam Thursday, so we'll be in this room. Um, I don't think you'll need the full two hours, but obviously you'll have it. It's going to be I think roughly like 15 multiple choice questions and then three to four with some multiple part short answer questions. You know, the short answer primarily being related to regression. So, you know, kind of work through more examples on Monday, do some more review. I think that'll be helpful. If you get a chance to look at those practice exams, um, and you have specific questions, we can kind of start out with those. Before I let you get out of here, there's one more thing I want to point out to you. Now, obviously, that last assignment you still could turn in. Like I mentioned, I will drop kind of the, the lowest of across the homework type. So I can't get that factored in now until after Monday. So before we or you know before we meet for the final, it'll be factored into Canvas. Um, I'll get it updated on Tuesday. But I did have this. Oh, I don't know. It's not downloading. I've got it in here anyways. So I uploaded this to Canvas, which is this figure out your grade tool. So hit OK. So we've got all these different things. So this is like a person. Like if you go to Canvas right now, you can see. Um, and I'll get, I can't remember if I have it updated for your class or not, but I will have it updated before Monday. Actually, I'll have it updated before I leave the office. I'll just do it right when I get back to my office. Kind of what your eye clicker grade is with the lowest drop, right? Kind of then what your Excel grade is, you can find kind of that what's your grade in that category in Canvas, your individual assignment grade, and then your connect grade. So those are like the different categories on Canvas, and you can see what your grade is in each category, right? You can then put in what you got in the first two exams. Now, that's already done on Canvas. Like that's how, you know, it was weighting them according to the syllabus. But what I've done in here is because you haven't taken the final yet, I've got the potential grade so you could play around with, well, okay, this person, if I get a 50 on the exam, I can still get a B minus in the class, right? And then, well, what do I need to get an A? I don't know. If I get an 80, it's not going to quite cut it. Get a 90, it's not going to quite cut it. I guess this person, based off the grade, is probably going to have to get a pretty high grade, right? But if you're on the cusp of different things, you can kind of figure out, like, I know you've got multiple classes that you might have exams for. So, you know, if you've done really well, like, I don't know, if I put a bunch of 90s in here and then I figure out, like, I can actually do really poorly on this final and still get an A in the class, 
maybe you study a little more for some of your other classes that you, you need to kind of boost your grade a little more for than, than this one, or vice versa. Maybe you figure out like you really need to do well on this one to get the grade that you want, so you can put a little more energy towards this class and others. Yeah. But well, what do people usually get on the final? Um, it kind of varies, but I mean the the averages. So I would say usually it's hard to say. So the average is about the same, but to be completely honest, it's usually people that did better on the first two. I know your brain works because some people it's like much more computation before a lot more comprehensive interpretation like bigger picture and so i've had people do very poorly like on exam one two and then do like ace the, the final right that's it it's going to be heavy linear regression right um but usually the average is about you know around an 80. um okay. for this class it might be i, I forget because i'm I'm thinking more of like a regular non honor section. Okay. Like usually the final I think is around a like low 70 to mid 70, but I'm remembering right from the honors, like you guys are always so about a letter grade higher. So it's probably around an 80 or a low 80. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. what's in the error? Like no five or mid grade? Yeah. So I think this I have it in the syllabus, but basically yeah. my threes are the cutoffs, right? So if you go 63 or, or to, to uh, 66 point. Nine nine, that's a B okay. or a D. Sixty seven and above would be a D plus. Below a sixty three would be a D minus, and that would apply to the C B A category, with the exception of just a ninety three or higher than that. Yeah. No rounding between the. Um. <laughs> so don't expect. I, I mean, I wouldn't plan all these things, but what I I do I do with the final grades, and I I believe this is also stated in the syllabus, but I um. Uh, so let's say you get like an 82 point, I don't know, nine, nine. That's going to be an 80. Like, it'd be like I could have made an error at some point in this semester. So for me to be like hard and fast, like maybe there was one point that you really should have had, right? Like we all make mistakes. Like there's going to be, right, I have a confidence interval, right? Like I, you know, so, so usually what I do is once we have the final grades in, I round everything up um, so that I just kind of have it displayed as an integer. Now, initially, when I upload it, it's going to look like a decimal. So, if, like you're on the cusp and you're worried about it, I do, I do kind of round those grades up. Yeah. Any other questions for you guys out here? All right, we'll do some last, uh, you know, a little bit more review on Monday, and then we'll uh, be ready for the final next week. I'll mention more about uh, some office hours I'll have next week on Monday as well.